Good evening, I'm Elaine Holden from the North Carolina Transportation Museum and we welcome you here this evening. But I wanted to share an announcement as well that last night, some of you watching the Smithsonian Channel's documentary, The Green Book Guide to Freedom, you may have experienced a disruption or even a blank screen with the video having been removed from our YouTube channel. We apologize for that. And we have worked with the Smithsonian Channel today to have an encore streaming of the documentary this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. So we're working on it. We haven't gotten final approval, but we will email all registrants of tonight's webinar and Monday night streaming with viewing details once we get that approval. Keep a lookout in your mailbox and our website tomorrow. Also, tonight's webinar is being uploaded to Facebook, as well as YouTube. And so a recording of this evening will be posted on those channels tomorrow. Now to turn it over to DeTarvia Parish for a wonderful evening of conversation. Thank you, Elaine. Good evening. I am DeTarvia Parish, an Associate Professor of Humanities at Livingstone College. Welcome to the Green Book Project, North Carolina Travels Down Memory Lane. This is a live virtual event. Any questions you would like to pose during the program, please post them in the chat. For all of you out there in Zoom land, happy Black History Month. For the next 60 minutes, we will produce an unedited conversation with our Congress of spokespersons. Indeed, there are many other spokespersons with experiences as it relates to traveling American highways. Our goal today is to relate real experiences that contribute to the common thread of showcasing life of African-Americans in America in the face of oppositions that is largely due to systemic power structure of racism. As this system manifested in many forms, repressive laws and customs specifically designed to restrict African-Americans evolved and gained popularity known as Jim Crow, a term itself that evolved and transformed from menstrual acts that socially degraded African-Americans on stage to policies and practices that degraded African and dominated throughout America. The most infamous images of Jim Crow injustices are in the South and are the indelible and unforgettable separate wet bathrooms, separate water fountains, and separate schools. But as noted in the book by Steve Luxenberg, the story of Plessy versus Ferguson and America's journey from slavery to freedom the impetus of separating the races was a Northern one. As a result, a postman who was a resident of Harlem, New York, Victor Hugo Green, who married Alma Duke of Virginia, were inspired. Victor Green managed Robert Duke, his brother-in-law, who was also a musician while working at the post office. As Duke toured as a musician and experienced firsthand the threats and difficulties African-Americans suffered, the idea to create the Black Travels Guide was born. The Negro Motorist Green Book. Spanning over the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, this pocket-sized five by seven inches publication was more than a travel aid. It was a guide for keeping some Americans safe. The 12th state in America, North Carolina, had 327 businesses listed in the Green Book from restaurants and hotels to tourist homes, nightclubs, and beauty salons. North Carolinians and state travelers were introduced to complex statewide networks of business owners or oasis spaces for a variety of travelers. Today, we welcome Angela Thorpe of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission to share more about oasis and spaces. Angela, we would like to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. Thank you for having me. Uh, and again, I am delighted to share uh, a bit of today's stage with, with my esteemed colleagues. As you mentioned, North Carolina was home to 327 oasis spaces or, or green book sites. And we take this phrase, oasis spaces, incredibly seriously. If you think about what it might have been like to travel during the Jim Crow era, to move your body from place 
to plays across North Carolina and beyond at a time where there were no GPSs, at a time where you relied on maps, at a time where there were no public highways and ending up in the wrong town at the wrong time could be a life or a death scenario. These places did serve as an oasis in our state uh, at a time that again, could be dangerous to black people in their bodies. And so the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission sought to understand more about these realities for black people in our state and beyond in 2017. It is in this year that we were awarded a grant by the Institute of Museum and Library Services to explore the Green Book and the impact that it had on people in North Carolina and buildings and, and, and business owners in North Carolina. We worked for three years from 2017 to 2020 to deeply understand these sites. That included inventorying these sites, taking photographs of these sites in their modern day state, whether modern day meant uh, a site itself or perhaps a parking lot, or in some cases, the bus station or the Carolina Panthers Stadium. We researched these sites so we could tell full stories about what they meant for their communities and explore who owned them. And we collected oral histories of people connected to people who own these Green Book sites and of people who traveled across North Carolina and beyond during the Jim Crow era. We use this research and, and, and this data and these stories to develop a number of resources, including a pop-up exhibit that you can see at the North Carolina Transportation Museum and online on the commission's website at aahc.nc.gov. That exhibit is called Navigating Jim Crow, the Green Book in North Carolina, 1936 to 1966. And again, it takes a deeper look at the Green Book. It helps us to understand how black people, whether they were traveling by bus, car, or train, traveled across the state and beyond, maybe for vacation or, or business, even education. And then finally, it helps us pull back the layers and understand these sites as not just static places, but really places of resistance, right? The people who owned these Green Book sites were often activists in their own right. They helped to cultivate activist networks within their communities and across the state. They helped to encourage people who patronize their businesses to be activists. And finally, they cultivated these spaces specifically to push against the oppression and the system that Jim Crow laws enforced in North Carolina. And so again, we look at the Green Book and Green Book sites in our state is oasis spaces and sites of resistance. And so I hope that you connect to that exhibit either at the Transportation Museum or digitally on the commission's website. We also have a number of other resources from educator guides to uh, profiles of each of the Green Book sites available online so you can learn more about the Green Book in North Carolina and our work. And I'm delighted to hear from people today who can speak more to and illustrate a little bit more about what I was talking about. So with that, I will yield my time and, and give the floor back to you, Dr. Parrish. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Angela, thank you. And let's shift to our designated spokespersons for the evening. I'm gonna list them in alphabetical order. Today, we have Dr. State Alexander, who is the executive assistant to the president and vice president for communications and public relations at Livingstone College. A former advisory member of the North Carolina Transportation Museum, Dr. Alexander is a native of Winston-Salem with a plethora of experience in television, radio broadcasting, marketing, and advertising. This Navy veteran has committed 28 years to Livingstone College and much more to the North Carolina community in public service, community engagement, and media relations. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. State Alexander.
Give us a wave, Dr. Alexander. Our next spokesperson is Councilwoman Sir Luda B. Anthony. She is a native of Monroe, North Carolina, and currently serves as the town city council. Councilwoman Anthony is a community activist, child advocate, and political organizer who is rooted and committed to Monroe. A child of two educators, Anthony has personal experience with the Green Book and various other survival modes African Americans implemented to live in Southern America. Salute to be Anthony, give us a wave. Our next spokesperson is Mary Pons. Mayor Mary Pons is a retired educator and native of Rowan County who served the Granite Quarry Town Board of Aldermen. She's the first woman and first African-American to be mayor in Granite Quarry, a town predominantly white in demographics and notoriously known for its Ku Klux Klan leadership. Pons served as mayor for 14 of her 16 years. Give us a wave, Mayor Pons. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Spearman. T. Anthony Spearman is a life member of the NAACP who currently serves as the North Carolina president. Dr. Spearman has spent a lifetime fighting for justice as a courageous and committed servant leader of our community. An ordained minister within the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, he works extensively in leadership of the denomination in North Carolina and has been an advantageous civil rights and political advocate for equity, education, and American democracy. Dr. Spearman, give us a wave. And I'm gonna start my questions with Dr. Spearman. Dr. Spearman, as you serve as the North Carolina State President of the National Associ Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, an organization that has been the nation's premier civil rights advocate where much of its foundation is geared in securing constitutional rights and opposing racism and violence in our nation. Why were or are organizations like the NAACP and tools like the Green Book necessary in the everyday lives of some Americans? Thank you for the question, Dr. Parrish. And thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful and historic event in Black History Moment. The Whenever one resides in what I call a contrived nation, contrived meaning that it's deliberately created, and certainly the United States of America is a contrived nation, and the iniquitous stronghold of racism, which is the social controller of this nation, can be traced back to a colony of Virginia in 1680 by the House of Burgesses, the governing body who for purposes of determining who would have access to power, privilege, property, and wealth, debated the question, what is a white man? Therein you have the historical foundation of the social construction of whiteness or the concept of building a white race in America. And so when you have that type of historical foundation and social construction, it means that the other or the black man in our case is certainly going to be not privileged, not having access to property, not having access to power and not having access to wealth. You thereby need tools like the Green Book and organizations like the NAACP to protect the equality of rights of African-Americans and other minorities. Interestingly enough, the NAACP, which was founded in 1909 by a body of individuals who were, uh, were, were multicultural, there were precursors to the NAACP who did the very same thing that the NAACP was founded on the principles of, such as the Afro-American Council, the African-American League, the Niagara Movement, the Committee of 12 in 1904. And of course, we know on and on and on, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, SNCC, 
the Student Nonviolent Community Coordinating Committee, SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Mississippi Improvement Association, all of these were organizations that had to protect the rights of African-Americans because we reside in this contrived nation. I was very, very pulled in and drawn in and, and appreciated very much the documentary last night, albeit disrupted at some point, but drawn in because my family, my father migrated north to have his children, to have his family. And so oftentimes I didn't really understand when I was a child why we would caravan from New York to North Carolina, why we went on a certain route from New York to North Carolina, why my father would use the same gas stations and some of the same facilities as we traveled along the route and why they traveled at a certain time of the day or night. I didn't know until later on why those things were happening. And certainly the, the implementation of the Green Book was very, very important in the lives of African-Americans so that we would not show up somewhere uh, and our lives had been taken from us. So mm -hmm. the, the Green Book is a very, very important tool. And some of the sites that they talked about like the A.G. Gaston uh, 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 Hotel, was very, very, we, 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 we recognized those names uh, when we would travel to certain spaces and certain spots. And certainly to bring those into, into our sphere of understanding today is very, very important because justice, fighting for justice, the struggle for justice and equality is interminable. In other words, it will continue on and on. It ebbs and flows. It will never go away for us, unfortunately. I don't think, I know that in my lifetime, we won't reach equity. Perhaps in yours, Detarvia, we will, but uh, you know, it may be your children, in your children's lives that we are able to recognize it and realize it. Uh, so until those times, we have to continue to instill in those who come behind us the importance of the green book because there's still, you know, the truth of, if the truth be told, there's still a green book that we have to abide by. And if nothing else reminds us of that, it's January 6th, 2021, when the storm, where the forces stormed the Bastille or the, the Capitol. And if it had been representatives <laughs> from Black Lives Matters, they would not have been able to get into that building. Trust you, me, that would not have happened. So uh, that's my response to the question. It's gonna continue to be necessary. The Green Book and the philosophy behind the Green Book is gonna continue to be important in the lives of African-Americans. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for highlighting that racism, of course, is a social construct. And in addition to, I guess, this, this metaphorical green book that exists within our uh with, that exists within our society today and speaking of that i'm going to move on to uh councilwoman anthony as you spoke about travel so councilwoman anthony as a child of two educators you stated previously your family actually used the green book during the summers to travel tell us about your experience also, as, as Dr. Spearman has mentioned, what did you understand about this tool as a child? Did your parents ever stress its importance? And most of all, as an adult who formerly serves as the city of Monroe and all of its citizens, you have lived and undergone various experiences. Do you understand or identify with your parents implementing these resources that provided safe mechanisms and perhaps geared itself in an opposite direction of confronting injustice and civil liberties. Councilwoman Anthony, will you please unmute your device? You're on mute. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be involved in this uh, also important Zoom. It is so important that um, much younger people understand that the struggle that we have been on for, for so many years 
and can sort of appreciate and begin to know that the struggle is real. First of all, as a child, um, I had somewhat of an understanding uh, of racism. My parents would sit down and talk to us about um, problems uh, that we as a, a people face. Um, they talked to us about inequality. Um, we were taught um, when we encountered um, uh, white people that always look them in the eye and never look down. Uh, we, we were not told to say yes, sir, no, sir, to them, but yes and no. But um, going back to the Green Book, we actually had a Green Book. Um, as you said in the beginning, we will travel, especially in the summers, to different states. And my parents would, when they mapped it out, would also find out where we would be staying um, and contact those people prior to getting there. Um, I can remember vividly staying in Richmond, Virginia, however, I don't recall the name of the place. Uh, and that was on a trip to New York. We would always uh, go in the daytime, we'd always leave early in the morning, and we'd always travel during the day. Uh, it was thought that if you were out caught somewhere in the night and for some reason you had car trouble or needed gas or something, that it, it could be very dangerous. During those times in the early parts, the crew cut claims were uh, really out and about and, and doing their little uh, devilish activities. But the Green Book provided for us safe, safe forage because we knew that there would be a place to rest. Uh, the Green Book provided us with places where we know we could eat or get gas. Many times my, my mother would prepare lunches that could carry us to that safe place. Um, and we didn't veer from that. During times that we would travel for funerals, sometimes it would be at spur of the moment. And uh, then we would use the um, uh, from other masons that my father knew along the way that he would call and find out, you know, where we could get gas, where could we could stop and get something to eat. But it was very real. As I have grown older, I have encountered many systemic racist uh, initiatives along the way. I can now understand between equality and equity. I see now how, how white privilege has uh, been a blockage for um, beginning to eradicate racism because nobody wants to give up power. Uh, I do understand now, especially the last four years that we've gone through with the attempt to take us back from some places that we have come from. And I know we have digressed in a lot of ways. And I do think that now that majority of people, at least we are, we, we are awake now. And so it's up to us now to involve ourselves in initiatives like this so we can rise above this. Um, I wasn't fully aware that we were in the state we were in until the attempted insurrection. Uh, that really took me by surprise. I didn't know that the hate was as wide as it is. I just thought it was a, a, a group of people, maybe a small group. By small, I don't mean one to 200. I knew it might have been thousands, but I had no idea that it was as well organized. I thought it was splintered groups of little militia here and militia there. But I, I, I do know that it will take us as a people to come together, to unite, to register, to vote, uh, to be heard, to hold people accountable. And then this has a specific question, I'm, that's what I had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you mentioning the fact that we have to come together. And of course, we all must be accountable for our actions. Mm -hmm. So that moves me along to our next spokesperson, Dr. State Alexander. Dr. Alexander, there is a book by Frank Tercy named Winston-Salem in History, whereas the former journal reports, he actually talks about people being together. He says they, whites and blacks, work in the same factories, but he talks about this segregation. They went home to different neighborhoods, 
They worked in their own churches, shopped in their own stores, and were cared for by their own doctors and dentists. His comments are in relation to Jim Crow practices and segregation in Winston, yet it also allows readers to gain another perspective. If Blacks indeed shopped in their own stores, attended their own churches, visited their own medical professionals, then that attests to Black entrepreneurship, ownership, and in many cases, economic success. As a native of Winston-Salem, share with us the operation of some of these successful businesses that may have or should have been listed in the Green Book as Oasis Spaces. Thank you, Dr. Parrish, my colleague at Livingstone. I'm proud to be a part of this conversation uh, this evening and uh, to see other faces I know uh, very well. I am a native of Winston-Salem and one of the things that we have been and, and remain proud of is the um, Safe Bus Company. Uh, the Safe Bus Company was black owned and operated uh, organization of buses that provided transportation throughout the city of Winston-Salem. It didn't start out that way initially. It was a, a loose knit organization of what they call jitneys or buses that carried people to and from work and from home to work or from work to home. Um, it was a loose knit organization and they had territories that these uh, jitneys had to uh, provide transportation for. But eventually, one person decided that that wasn't working very well and that right. these persons and these various disparate companies should come together and formulate a bus company. So there will be rules and everybody could follow them. And that's what they did. They created an organization called Safe Bus Company. And that title was deliberate because that was one of the things that they said and assured the city government that was part of their brand and part of their title and how people uh, got to know them. And it was a wide, widely heralded company. Ebony Magazine used to carry stories of, about Safe Bus Company. And it was a major bus company, it had employees, and it, it had technicians, drivers, secretaries. So not only was it a major company, but it provided jobs for people in the segregated Winston-Salem at that time. Ironically, at some point, the white owned bus company uh, that, that covered the um, areas in the white segregated part of the city uh, fell on hard times and Safe Bus Company had to take over the entire bus routes of the city. And that increased their revenue. Wow. Wow. Uh, but they were challenged by the same challenges that the white old bus companies were having in terms of their the, the territories being so spread out, it, it didn't provide a good uh, business operation. So eventually in 1972, the company um, folded and the, and the city took it over. And now they have the Winston-Salem um, Transit Authority in Winston-Salem. But this company was a source of pride. But it was also the what somebody has called the mother of invention or the, the mother of need in that since we could not traverse across the city in certain ways, um, these folks decided they would create their own business opportunity. And so this bus company was created. And so out of that experience, um, and if you knew Western Salem at that time, the um, black owned bus company, the safe bus co company, ended its route right at the uptown of Western Salem. So right at that demarcation line, there were black owned shops, stores, all kinds of barber shops, hairdressing and, and, and doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, right in this one space where the bus companies, where people got off the bus there. My father would sometimes take me uptown and that's where we got off, right at that place. And so it was an attractive place. It was a beehive of activity. But what it demonstrates to me is that sometimes in spite of these challenges that people put in front of us, we have the opportunity and the ingenuity and creativity to create our own opportunity. You don't have to wait for somebody to give you permission to do something. Um, but we can, out of need and necessity, as was the case in the segregated uh, South and in Western Salem at that time, found a way to turn what would have been a bad situation into a good one. And it only went South after uh, integration came into play 
and things. And we have, we lost our way in terms of um, entrepreneurship, as you mentioned, and other kinds of um, opportunities that we found in that segregated uh, environment. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, and as you mentioned, entrepreneurship and ingenuity, I want to mention the Green Book, the 1940 edition, Ashton says Livingstone College and the Transportation Museum is in Rowan County. It did list on page 36, Safety Taxi, which is okay. also a transportation uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, company, like the Safe Bus Company. So yeah. you put me in mind of, of safety and, and Dr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Tracy, who actually had that vision to provide that service um, in the face of opposition and, and many more things in Rowan County. So thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to shift on trip. over. I said I happen to know Mr. Trump. Go ahead, Dr. Well. Well. Oh, I fantastic. Well. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Mayor Pons. Mayor Pons in, in the 1948 edition of the Green Book, the office wrote, there will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. That is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this publication for then we can go wherever we please and without embarrassment. In 1999, you were elected as the first African-American and female mayor to serve a town known for its segregationist strongholds where many people might face prejudice or danger because of their skin color. As the Green Book provides a stark image of what the world was like, it also offered advice to its readers with a pleasant and encouraging tone. In fact, the text usually avoided discussing racism in explicit terms. It seems while producing an essential tool to fulfill the needs of the people, the publishers recognized themselves as leaders and held themselves accountable for their actions. Whereas in this case, it entails their language as it relates to the narrative and rhetoric of the text. Because so many of us have mentioned the incident in Washington on January 6th, I want us to think about this. When breaking barriers and moving in uncharted territories, how important is the positive language to a leader? Moreover, revisiting that 1948 quote of hope, share with us some transitions that your town have, has made with you as a leader and the message in, in which you presented to your township. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. And Mayor Paz, if you want to unmute. I did, did I not? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you, Dr. Parrish, for this uh, opportunity. In reading my question <laughs> and talking about the Green Book and the quote that was made in 1948, where it says that there will be a day sometime in the near future when this guide will not have to be published. That is when we as a race will have equal opportunities and privileges in the United States. It will be a great day for us to suspend this publication for then we can go anywhere we please and without embarrassment. That, that, course, that quote has resonated with me for a while. For us to suspend this publication. Because, simply because we don't have a published Green Book, but we have the restrictions of the Green Book. And I find that to be very um, disappointing. I find it to be very heartbreaking. We don't have a published Green Book, but it's still a difficult time for Black people to travel, especially black men or men of color. So although it's not published, it still exists in a, um, in, in a very difficult way and at a very difficult time. And also in being the very first black African-American female the whole office in Granite Quarry, which is known as the home of the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. 
I was thinking today, I didn't wake up one morning and say, you know, I'm going to break a barrier today. I just happen to be at the right place at the right time and willing to serve and to do what had been deemed necessary to be done. When I was elected the mayor, well, really, I was elected as a uh, councilwoman because of the mayor's voted on by the councilman. And I just, by the grace of God, had the, num the highest number of votes, and it made me uh, to be named the mayor of Granite Quarry. That did not come without challenges. <laughs> that was a dark time because that, that challenge did not come without the challenges of prejudice, the challenge of hatred, and the challenge of um, a black woman cannot tell a white man what to do. My counsel was basically men that were in their 60s and older. I just happened to be the youngest and I was a female. So I came with, there was a lot of opposition. But in that time, I realized that in breaking a barrier, I had to set a precedence. I had to be strong. I had to be uh, straightforward. I had to be honest. And I had, I had to let people know that I could be trusted and that I knew what I was doing. What I didn't know, I read about or I asked. So when I was in front of my board, they thought I knew everything because I had sought the information that I needed in order to make my decisions clear. Being in Granite Quarry and being the mayor of a town, and there were nearly 20,000 people in Granite Quarry at that time. And being the mayor of a female, a little short black lady, trying to tell other people what to do, was uh, a, it was a challenge, but they never knew. I had to present myself to be worthy of that position. I had to present myself to be accountable for that position. And Grand Aquarius was a little town that was uh, within the county, but it was not well known within the county because it was not represented throughout the county. Uh, the mayor was not that active as opposed to being an appearance. So I took a different role. I made myself available to the people. I uh, attended events where many times I was the only black, but I never let that bother me. I attended their churches. I was the only black. A lot of times I would go to their churches and they would want, look at me as if to say, are you lost? Or who are you here for? But I never dropped my head. I always held my head high. I can look them in the eye and I could speak for them word for word. I, we did things within the community that involved the people that they all had to come out that involved blacks as well as the white, um, the white citizens. And I brought pride to the town and went, because I became very, very active in so many organizations. And every time someone would ask me if I would be a part of a club or committee or board, I readily accept it, but I always accept it under the premises that this I'm representing the town of Granite Quarry. So as I began to go out and be and mingle with people and people got to know who I was and they and I knew them, then the people in the town started there were articles in the paper, so they became, they had more pride about the town itself. I encouraged a lot of black guys, young men, to join our police force because the police force never had any black representation. I asked even for the fire department. We never had any representation there. So I, I did help 
several young black men to become part of those uh, departments, the fire department, as well as the uh, police department. We also had a black in the office area, but we have to continue to work to push and encourage people to become leaders and uh, to stand strong and don't be fearful because when people find that you are weak, you're not gonna last long. You have to be strong. And they found that I was, I was short in height, but that was the only thing that was short about me. <laughs> but I had to be strong because when I first took office, when I remember I said that I didn't take that office without opposition, my fire department quit. The entire fire department walked out. Simply, you know, they walked out because I voted against them having a copy of machine in the fire department. They had been used to doing what they wanted to, or things were going their way, and I voted against that. And they got angry and they quit. But that was just a stepping stone for me to stand even taller. And uh, we have uh, the other fire departments came in that, because we had mutual aid. They came in and they helped us. And then as time went on, the fire department started coming back one by one and it made a stronger fire department. And little, you all have talked about the, well, I don't know if you all mentioned the, uh, the Route 66 and the Sunnydale Towns. I don't know how many. Film. Yes, that was on the film. Grand Aquaria Bunts, a sundown town known as Faith, North Carolina. I remember that as a child where you were not there after dark. And they had a sign that indicated that you better not be caught in faith after sundown and faith now <laughs> they have one of the biggest celebrations for the 4th of july but black people are hesitant to attend and when i was mayor they invited us to be in their parade and and um we had never done that but i did it I was in the faith parade, probably the only, I was the only black participant in their parade. And I waved and threw candy and just cheered. So they knew I was not afraid to step out and to represent. And when my town found out that I was not afraid, they joined in and they supported me. After I retired, after I, um, left the board. I, I did not run, but my people wanted me to run. And I told them, if it is whatever you all want me to do, I will do it. I ran. They ran me. I paid not, I had not one red penny in this campaign. They ran me as a write-in. And I lost 17 votes. So that, to me, that spoke well of the accomplishments of the town of Granite Quarry. Because anytime people see that you have their interests at heart, they will support you. When you involve them and they know that you care about them, they will support you. But I just, uh, also want to say that it's not necessarily what I did, but it was the that I took on my presence in my stance that made a difference. And when when I'm, by me being the first, it only opens doors to say that black young boys and young girls and men and women can do the exact same thing because the door is open. The shoulders that I stood on, I want also to make sure that my shoulders are wide enough for someone else to stand on. If I can encourage a young black person, that is my responsibility. 
or if I can encourage a young person, period, that is my position. Because a lot of times the government representation are gray-headed people. They're bald-headed, gray-headed people. <laughs> we don't have many young people. And we need to encourage our young people because if we're going to um, eliminate or eradicate Jim Crow, the prejudices, the injustices that are upon our race, we're going to use our young people because our young people are more attuned to work together, regardless of race, than we are. I think, um, and prejudice is everywhere. My brother um, broke the barrier for the Rowan County Schools in 1963 when he integrated East Rowan High School. And that was one of my first times really, really, really understanding what prejudice really was. Because our house, at our home, we had a cross burned. And my brother had to be escorted to school. Wow. And a lot of people don't realize that, but the Boy Scout troop in Granite Quarry, the Black Boy Scout troop, guarded our house. You would turn into our driveway and you would just see guns because they protected us. We lived on a main highway. So my brother is a, is a, a really <laughs> the barrier breaker. He started all of this. And then uh, we just have to be ready and do what the Lord has in store for us to do. And when I say I was the right person at the right time, I didn't seek to be a councilwoman. I was approached and asked, not by my race, not by black, but by a white person, if I had ever considered. And in order to get them off my back, <laughs> I went and signed up to run. Not, I had no idea that I would win. And when they called the votes, I, had, I was at the town hall. I, I, I was so naive, I did not even know to listen for my number. They called my name last, and I had, I didn't even know how many votes I had. And then they repeated it, and someone walked over to me and said, do you realize what that means? I said, what are you talking about? They said, you could be the mayor of Granite Quarry. My response was, not in this town, I won't be. But look what God did. Yes, I was mayor. For, I was on the board for six, 16 years. I was mayor for 14. In my last two years, I stepped down so that my mayor pro tem could get the practice and the uh, feel of being the mayor. So I am grateful. I am humbled for all that has happened to me or all that I have been able to hopefully make a difference in someone's life. Um, and I think I have, I think I've answered your question. I hope I have. And one of the things at the very last that you asked me, you said when breaking barriers and moving in uncharted territories, how important is this positive language to a leader? My response to that is, we have to be positive, optimistic, and we have to use positive and optimistic language in order to survive. Because in being positive and optimistic, that means that we have hope, that we can see something. We have a vision. And when we get to the point that we don't have that optimistic attitude and that positive attitude, we have lost the battle. And my thing is, I'm going to fight. I'm going to serve until I die. And as long as the Lord gives me breath, I'm going to do what he has in store for me to do. And I appreciate this opportunity. And, um, I have enjoyed the, um, the the information given by all of the participants tonight. So thank you, Dr. Parrish, for asking me. 
And thank you. Thank you for your leadership, for your strength and your, for your resilience as uh, a woman in leadership so others can actually follow. We do have a question in the chat. Are there any more questions that we have for our panelists? There is one question here that reads, um, are there any sundown towns in North Carolina today? What I am familiar with is James Lowen. He is actually also the person who wrote Lies My Teacher Told Me. He has a text in 2005 that says, sundown towns, a hidden dimension of American racism. And he lists a few towns in North Carolina. I'm gonna read them off for you, uh, for the person who asked that question. It's Bakersville, Brasstown, Faith, Graham County, King, Curry Beach, Mayoden, Mitchell County, Rossman, Southern Shores, Spruce Pine, Surf City, Swain County, Trent Woods, and Wrightsville. So that's a pretty lengthy list for the state of North Carolina. But in James Lowen's uh, work in 2005 published, those are the towns that he actually lists as South Carolina. You mentioned Faith. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Which is real, real close to where we are. Yes, ma'am. Faith has 800 and some people. And they're, uh, they have 96% white and 3% African American. A lot of these. Exactly. A lot of these towns are sundown, but there are no signs, but people know where to go and where not to go and when to leave if you go. That's, so that's interesting. What Dr. Spearman said earlier about that metaphorical green book. Exactly. Right. Yes. Saying, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you. And I want to ask you uh, for one 60 seconds of final thoughts to add to this I see another question in the chat. Give me one second, let me see that question. I thought I saw another question posed in the chat. I guess not. Okay, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds of final thoughts for each panelist, and we'll just begin in the order in which we started. So we will start with Dr. Spearman. What would you like to leave us with, final thoughts? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. I I, um, I really have um, resonated with a lot of thoughts of everyone who has spoken. I, I just wanted to uh, go back and say to Mayor Pons that she didn't have to rummage in her mind too much longer if she was talking about gray-headed folks. And then all of a sudden she went back and she found the bald-headed folks. <laughs> so uh, I thank you for that, my sister. But anyway, uh, one of the things that I want us to be keenly aware of, and thank you so much for, for this presentation on the Green Book this evening. Um, one of the things that I want to leave those who are listening with is how important it is for us to realize and understand that the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, whose mission statement is to ensure the political educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination is a, the NAACP is what we call and refer to as a reconstruction organization. By that, we mean that the NAACP embraces three of the amendments to the constitution, the 13th amendment, the 14th amendment, and the 15th amendment. And I say to the people that I come into contact with, don't you ever forget that the greatest stimulus package that you have ever received is the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments. Make sure that you embrace them, make sure that you learn about them, make sure that you have them to become your green book that will protect you in the days to come. Thank you for the opportunity to make some last and final remarks. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Spearman. And I want to highlight that 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. 13th Amendment 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any of its jurisdictions except for punishment of a crime. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is our abolishing slavery. Our 14th Amendment is our right to citizenship, persons born or naturalized in the United States. And our 15th Amendment is our voting rights. And I think the NAACP does an excellent job in promoting voter awareness and voting rights and keeping our vote protected. So thank you so much, NAACP, for all the work you're doing, especially under the leadership of Reverend Dr. T. Anthony Spearman in the state of North Carolina. Amen. Right, we're gonna move over to Dr. El no, Sir Luda Anthony. Leave us with final remarks. <laughs> okay, again, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to stress the point that this is Black History Month and that we should share our history with everyone, especially younger people who are not aware of our accomplishments and our contributions to uh, this country. This country was built on our backs, but I want to embrace the point that Black History Month is every month, even though Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, started it back in 1926. And um, to add something about my town of Monroe, one thing that uh, we were able to do after the tragic death of George Floyd was to initiate a conversation over racism. And from that, we have begun the dialogue to start working toward being an anti-racist town. And we're working now on a DEI committee. I'm very proud of that. But uh, we need to keep hope alive and stress education of our young people, teach them about the voting process. It's important to register and vote. It's important that we attend meetings, make our voice heard and our bodies seen. Thank you. All right, and I wanna thank you, Councilwoman Anthony in the town of Monroe with your community activism and your political organizing. Uh, and you're doing a great job in Monroe, particularly also with voting. Thank you. All right. And what about you, Dr. Alexander? What would you like to leave us with? I want to give uh, a shout out and a thanks to the North Carolina Transportation Museum and Ms. Thorpe for putting on this conversation today. I think it helps to educate us all about how much more we have to do as a nation, as a people, as humanity to uh, make these strides and make these changes real and not just something we have on paper. So congratulations, Ms. Stork, for uh, leading this way. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Alexander. As a person who is deeply rooted in communications, I know that you can appreciate conversations as such to help us move forward in our plight. And last but certainly not least, Mayor Pons, leave us with final words. Thank you very much. I too would like to thank the North Carolina uh, Transportation Museum for this opportunity. And I also would like to thank you for, for doing this and inviting us to participate. My thought, I would like, I, I, have, I have two statements. One is black history is every day. Every day is black history. And my second thought is nothing is accomplished out of fear. So if we're going to grow and strive, we can't do it in fear. We've got to step out and be bold. So nothing is accomplished out of fear. So once again, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again to all spokespersons. Thank you to Angela Thorpe. Uh, your tireless efforts to be active subjects of history by recognizing the past and present in an effort to improve the human condition and enhance the human prospect that contributes to the enrichment of life and the expansion of possibilities of knowledge in a free and empowered community, in a free and empowered society, and in a free and empowered mosaic world. The Green Book embodies visions that are real evidence of optimism, perseverance, and African-American entrepreneurship. And so does this conversation today. I thank you for joining us. Amen. I'd like to turn it over to Elaine Holden of the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Elaine, I am I'm sorry, I was on mute. 
<laughs> I was listening so intently that I was on mute, but uh, the North Carolina Transportation Museum is grateful uh, for the opportunity to have partnered with all of the participants here tonight, but especially Dr. Datarvia Parrish from Livingstone College. Um, really appreciate this evening. It is the museum's mission to not only preserve and interpret the history of all forms of inland transportation in North Carolina, but also to present its rich history in a manner which allows visitors to enjoy their experience as well as learn from it. And I believe that we have accomplished that tonight. And it is my hope that we can continue the education and conversation through exhibits like Navigating Jim Crow, the Green Book and Oasis Spaces in North Carolina, artifacts on display like the fire truck from the all black quick step hook and ladder company from Elizabeth City and restoration projects like the Jim Crow era passenger rail car. We are here to share the rich, diverse and inclusive transportation history of North Carolina. And we hope that you choose to come and visit the museum soon and that as we offer more programming virtually that you will take part. So thank you for a wonderful evening and for joining us and we look forward to seeing you here at the museum soon. <laughs>